Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that hasn't been discussed for a couple of years now, but there's still a fugitive out there who's wanted for allegedly murdering his wife. He's currently in hiding, out there somewhere in the world, living his life without having to take any responsibility for what he allegedly did. So my hope is that by making this video, I can bring this case back to light and people can just keep an eye out for this man and hopefully someday bring him to justice. But before we get into the case, I just wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. Native is one of my favorite sponsors here on this channel. I've been using their products for years now and they've never failed to impress me. I love Native because it's so important to me to be aware of what I'm putting in and on my body. Their deodorants are always aluminum free, paraben free, vegan and cruelty free, and they're made with simple and familiar ingredients like coconut oil and shea butter. Native's plastic free deodorants now come in new and improved 100% plastic free earth friendly packaging, which let me tell you, I am obsessed with. Using their same amazing formula as their regular deodorants, it still gives you that smooth, non-sticky feel that dries very quickly and lasts literally all day. There are days where I have to wake up early, I'm running out of the house, throwing on my deodorant, and then I work my 10 hour shift where I'm on my feet running around all day, and then I come home during lunch to let my dog out and run around with her at the dog park, and then I go and work out for an hour and I come home and somehow I'm still smelling fresh. The scents I now have include eucalyptus and mint, which is just such a fresh and clean smell, which is great for any gender. It's great for everyday wear. I really, really like this one. And then I have white tea and lilac, which is definitely getting up there to be one of my new favorites. I absolutely love floral scents, which you guys know I love floral, as you guys can tell. And this one just has a bit of a floral and like a soapy and fresh smell, which is absolutely amazing. And then I have cotton and lily, which is another amazing smell. This one has like a very powdery everyday scent. I really like this one. This one is also made for sensitive skin. It's made without baking soda, which is great for those with sensitive skin. And it's also vegan. I really like this one for the days after I shave my armpits. My skin is very sensitive right after I shave and I normally don't wear deodorant for the rest of the day. But this one really, really helps. I really like this one right after I shave and it's great for my very sensitive skin. My other favorite thing about Native is that they are a proud partner of 1% for the planet, committing 1% of plastic-free deodorant sales to environmental nonprofits. Normally, a three-pack of their plastic-free deodorants goes for $39, but if you click the link in my description box below and use code RachelShannon8, you can get them for $26, which is 33% off. With my code, you can also get 20% off of any of their body wash and their toothpaste, which I am also obsessed with. So again, make sure you click the link down below and use code RachelShannon8 to get 20% off of your native products. Thank you again so much to Native for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Katie Blavet. Catherine Ann Boyder Blavet grew up in the town of Simpsonville, South Carolina. She was the daughter of Patricia Piver and Richard Boyder, and her stepdad was Daniel Piver. Altogether, she had seven siblings, biological and I believe step-siblings. She had five sisters, Brandy, Taylor, Jennifer, Danielle, and Brittany, as well as two brothers, John and Brandon. She was described as being someone who genuinely enjoyed life. She was kind, loving, and was known to have a heart of gold. She absolutely loved animals, with her mom saying that she would befriend a cricket if she could. In 2015, when Katie was 21 years old, she got a job at Firehouse Subs while taking classes at Greenville Technical College. She wasn't exactly sure where she wanted to go with her degree yet, but she always knew that she wanted to work with animals. While she was working at Firehouse Subs, she met a 28-year-old man named Named John Plavet. He was a regular at Firehouse Subs because he had worked right next door at the Army Recruiting Office. John would always make it a point to talk to Katie when he was there, and Katie kind of felt an instant connection with him. According to Katie's mom, Katie would often find herself attracted to servicemen because her family had connections to the military. Katie's grandfather served in the military, and she had several uncles who served as well. So John definitely caught Katie's eye. 
Now, Katie also worked at Firehouse Subs with her niece, Cheyenne. Now, Katie technically was Cheyenne's aunt, but she was only four years older than her, so they were more so like sisters. They were super close and they were basically best friends and they called each other soulmates. Cheyenne also noticed the instant connection between Katie and John. She said that when she met John, she could tell why Katie liked him. He was a military man and he had already served 10 years. So to her, that meant that he was probably a nice guy who was selfless enough to serve his country. Now, John ended up telling Katie that he was actually still married and he had a daughter, but he said that they were going to be getting separated soon and that their marriage had had some issues for quite some time. But that did not deter Katie from starting a relationship with him. At first, Katie didn't tell anyone that she was seeing John. After their relationship started though, things progressed pretty quickly. Once everyone around her started finding out about the relationship, you know, she was telling people, um, but she would tell people around her that she loved John and that she was very, very happy with him. Those around her also could tell that she was very attracted to him, but her family said that maybe she should slow things down, maybe she should wait until he was officially divorced, but she was absolutely infatuated with him. During this time, Katie also decided that she wanted to enlist in the military herself. Because she had been dating John though, John couldn't actually be her recruiter, so she had to go through someone else, but she did ultimately get accepted into the army, and soon after, she began boot camp. While Katie was there, John would always find a way to sneak into camp to have these little secret visits with Katie. However, her time at boot camp didn't last long because she actually had a scoliosis, which was very painful and made it very difficult to keep up with the military's exercise regimen. This seemed to be something that bothered her as a kid, but it didn't seem to really give her any issues when she got older but the military kind of made it more noticeable again. So after a short time, Katie ended up leaving boot camp and returned back home to Simpsonville. So John and his ex-wife did ultimately get divorced, and after that, Katie and John moved in together. This happened only seven months after the couple started dating. So, like I said at first, those who had known John and met him at the sandwich shop said that he seemed like a really nice guy. But Katie's mother did not get a great impression of him. Like I said, Katie's family was very familiar with the military because a lot of the family was involved in the military. And Katie's mom basically explained that military men have this certain politeness about them that showed through normal, everyday interactions. However, she didn't really see this sort of military politeness in John and just something about him just did not sit right with Katie's mom. Now, Cheyenne recalled that her and Katie had always dreamed about the day that each of them would get married. They wanted their weddings to be something that they did together. They were going to be each other's maid of honor in everything. However, one day on December 7th, 2015, completely out of the blue, during this texting conversation, Katie had texted her mom that her and John had actually eloped. This was a total shock to Katie's entire family because no one knew why she would want to just randomly get married without anybody in her family there to support her. She literally didn't tell anyone. She just got married to John one random day and that was that. There was no wedding. There was no reception. There was no Cheyenne being her maid of honor. It was just they got eloped and then told everybody about it after. Her mother was not too happy with this decision because again, she did not like John, but Katie was an adult and there wasn't really much else that her mom could do. After they got married, the couple moved into a four bedroom home together. They did this with the intention of getting a roommate or two to help split the rent. So the couple asked Cheyenne if she wanted a room in the house and she agreed. The couple slept in their own bedroom while Cheyenne had her room and then one of the rooms was set up for John's daughter when she would come visit and then the other bedroom was converted into a game room. While living with Katie and John, Cheyenne got even more insight into their relationship and this is when she saw a lot of their relationship issues firsthand. So one thing that John was known for was that he liked to have people over at his house for some parties. Now, given that John was an army recruiter, he would often visit the high schools and the surrounding areas to try and recruit teens who were on the verge of graduation. This is how he met a lot of the high school students and he would often have them over to his house for these parties. I heard in one of the podcasts that I listened to that he sort of did this because he wanted an in with the high schoolers to try and recruit them. So that was sort of like a thing that he had going on but he would provide the students with alcohol and I believe drugs as well. But this was something that really upset Katie because obviously it's illegal to be providing underage kids with alcohol and drugs. So even though Katie would constantly ask him to stop, 
he would just ignore her. He told her that he was gonna do whatever he wanted and that she needed to mind her own business. This was until one day when the parents of one of the high school students, a 17-year-old girl named Tana, found out that she was attending these house parties. Of course, they were very unhappy that she was going to these house parties and was involved in drugs and alcohol, so they reported these parties to the school. So by February of 2016, the school notified police of these parties and during one of the parties, an officer went over to the house and of course saw that the house was full of teenagers. So one of the officers who showed up came up to the door and started knocking, trying to get in, but John locked the door and refused to answer it and told everyone to be quiet and told everyone not to answer the door. He said that the cops had absolutely no right to enter the house, all the while more cops were showing up and they were all walking around the perimeter of the house trying to find a way into the house. He continued his resistance and there was a standoff for eight hours before the cops finally got a warrant to enter the house. And of course, when they did so, they saw that John was clearly providing minors with alcohol, so he was arrested. At the time, he was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. So going back a little bit, the other thing that Cheyenne noticed about John and Katie's relationship was that they would get into very intense fights pretty often. Especially when John would drink, his temper would get absolutely out of control. There was one situation where the two were outside and they were just screaming at each other, going at each other, and Cheyenne actually had to go outside to break up the fight because there was a neighbor who was about to call police on them. So while John was being held in jail for these charges relating to providing minors with alcohol, police went ahead and questioned Katie to get more information on what was going on inside of the house. This is when Katie confided in police that John was a very violent man who had threatened to kill her. She said that that past January in 2016, so about a month before this entire house party thing happened, her and John had gotten into an argument where John was demanding that Katie show him her text messages, but she refused. So this fight escalated and he ended up grabbing his 357 revolver and pointed it at her head and he threatened to kill her. As he did this, he told her to unlock her phone and show him her messages, but she continued to refuse. So then he turned the gun on himself and threatened to take his own life. When she still wasn't showing him the messages, he went around the house to grab yet another firearm and then told Katie that he was gonna go out and kill everybody that she knew and then he left the home. After this incident, she did break up with John and went back home to move in with her parents. But even then, John still had this control over her. So even though they were separated and she wasn't even living with him anymore, he still found ways to exhibit his power over her. So when she was making this report at the police station, she had the revolver with her and she handed it over to police. At this time, she did file a domestic violence case against John. Now, while John was being held in jail, Katie actually decided to move back into the home that her and John once shared. The way she saw it was that it was her home too. She wasn't gonna let him stop her from living in her own home, especially since he was in jail at the time. But he was not in jail for long before he was released on bail. So once he left jail, he tried getting back into the home, but Katie had locked all of the doors and would not let him in. So he did try to enter the home through the window and I don't know if he was successful but from what I could gather I don't think he was but ultimately Katie did end up having to move out of the house because she simply couldn't afford it on her own during the entire time that followed over the course of eight months even though they were technically separated Katie never filed for divorce and her and John did continue talking on occasion and they would see each other every so often and they would hang out once in a while after moving out and back in with her parents Katie found out that John had already moved on and started a new relationship with someone else. Except the girl that he started a relationship with was a 17-year-old teenager named Hannah, who I briefly mentioned earlier. She was the one whose parents reported John for throwing these parties in the first place. According to Cheyenne, Hannah was absolutely infatuated with John. She pretty much cut off her entire family and all of her friends, and she only wanted to spend her time with John. Clearly, this was a very inappropriate relationship, because Hannah was a child technically, she was a minor, 
and John was almost 30. I feel like when you're a teenager that age, when you get this kind of attention from an older man, it kind of makes you feel special. Like, oh, I'm so young and this older man is now paying attention to me. So again, it's just John taking advantage of this young 17 year old naive teenager. So as John was progressing in his relationship with this 17 year old child, Katie was working to build herself back up and get her life back together without John. She was finally ready to cut ties with him and was ready to file for divorce. She started a new job at PetSmart in October of 2016, and she started hanging out with new people. She started getting particularly close with one young man who she worked with, who she was just friends with at the time. There was no romantic involvement. Well, there was one night where Katie and this new guy friend and Cheyenne and Cheyenne's boyfriend all remember this old abandoned house that they had known about when they were kids and they would hide out in and party in when they were younger. So during this month, the four of them went back to that house to hang out and smoke for a bit. But then by October 24th, 2016, at around 3 p.m., Katie was just getting off of her shift at PetSmart when she got a call from Cheyenne who asked her if she just wanted to come and grab some dinner. However, according to Cheyenne, she sounded a bit off and Katie seemed like she wasn't in the best of moods. Katie told her that she just wanted to drive around for a bit and that maybe she'll catch up with her later. But hours had passed and Katie still hadn't got back into contact with Cheyenne. So her and the rest of Katie's family started calling and texting Katie all throughout the night, but she wouldn't reply to anybody and she did not return home that night. Cheyenne also got into contact with John and also Hannah, who both said that they had not seen or heard from Katie that entire evening. So that next morning, Katie's mother, Patricia, went to the police station to officially file a missing persons report. At first, Cheyenne thought that maybe Katie's mom was just over-concerned and was paranoid and was overreacting. But when even more hours passed without any sign from Katie, the family went out and started searching for her themselves. Cheyenne continued to communicate with John, who seemed very concerned for Katie's well-being and seemed like he wanted to find her as well. He told Cheyenne that she could come over and borrow his car to continue searching, but by the time Cheyenne got there, the tire on John's car was apparently flat, so they all just waited at John's house for the time being. So I don't know if this was the same house that John and Katie had lived at or if this was a different house in a different area. Honestly, I'm not sure. However, they soon remembered that they actually had Katie's cell phone location, so they should be able to track her. I assume it was one of those like find my iPhones or find my friends type of things. So using this, they actually saw that Katie's phone was near the abandoned house that they used to park party at. When they started following the phone and they got closer, they actually saw that Katie's phone was in someone's house who lived near the abandoned house. So Cheyenne and John went over to that area and went over to the man's house to talk to him to see if he had seen or heard from Katie. And of course, the man said he hadn't. So they all returned back to John's house and waited. As they waited, they all started smoking and drinking. As far as I've seen, it was John, Cheyenne, and Cheyenne's boyfriend all at John's house at that time. Now, as a side note, I know it is kind of weird that Cheyenne was just hanging out at John's house and she just decided to drink and smoke while she was there. I thought this was pretty weird too when I first read it that instead of going out and searching for Katie, that Cheyenne waited at John's house and started smoking and drinking with him. But I do want to remind you guys that Cheyenne was only 17 or 18 years old at this time. She was very much into her teen rebellious years where all she wanted to do was hang out with friends and get into whatever trouble she could. So yes, she worried about her aunt and her best friend. Yes, she knew that her and John had a pretty bad relationship, but at the time, I don't think she suspected him of having anything to do with Katie's disappearance. And I honestly believe that she probably didn't think that anything bad happened to Katie. I feel like at this time, she probably just thought that Katie was out hanging out with someone and that maybe she lost track of time and maybe she lost her phone and that she would return back home shortly. So I don't want anybody in the comments to give Cheyenne too much grief about this. Now, by that evening, one of of Cheyenne's friends, someone I'm not exactly sure who it was, but they called her and asked her where she was and what she was doing. Cheyenne was kind of in a bad mood at that point, so I don't think she really wanted to talk, but this friend seemed very concerned and this concerned Cheyenne. So Cheyenne asked her family to come pick her up and then she left at John's house and I believe she left her boyfriend there. I don't know exactly what this phone call was pertaining to, but it seemed like this friend had some information because by that next morning, 
Katie's family got the most devastating phone call that they could have possibly imagined getting. Police had informed Katie's family that her body had been found by a friend who had been searching for her that evening, or I guess that next morning, on Wednesday, October 26th at 12.30 a.m. So I don't know if this necessarily was the same friend who had called Cheyenne or if this was a different one, but apparently she had been working that day and she got off at 12 a.m. So she decided to go ahead and check out the abandoned house to see if maybe Katie was there, because again, this was the same house that all of them used to go to when they were younger. And to her shock and horror, this friend did find Katie's body in the abandoned house. Katie, of course, was deceased and she was found in the basement of this house, which was located right off of Southeast Main Street. Her body was found laying under a pile of lumber, and it was obvious that she had been stabbed multiple times. EMTs reported that her time of death was at around 8 p.m. that previous Monday, so just a couple of hours after her and Cheyenne had discussed getting dinner that night. So, of course, police started their investigation into who could have been responsible for Katie's murder, but they also had to notify Katie's next of kin, which happened to be John, since they technically were still married. When police went to notify him, they were very shocked at John's behavior. He was unemotional, he was stoic, and he didn't seem too shocked or upset about his death. All he really had to say to police was just talk about how bad their relationship was. But at the time, police did not have enough to actually arrest and charge someone with Katie's murder. In their investigation, they were able to find that her black 2011 Ford Focus had been located near a car wash on Whitehorse Road, which was several miles away from where her body had been found in that abandoned house. Of course, her car was taken in for examination, but as far as I've seen, I don't know why her car was found in that location or if anything of significance was found in her car. But still, police had their theories and they had their sights set on John and their theory was that maybe John had killed Katie because of their upcoming domestic violence case. They thought that maybe that day John had tried to confront Katie about dropping the charges or something like that. Because if John was charged, he could be sent to prison and he would lose his standing with the US military. So he had a lot to lose if these charges went through. So police think that maybe he went to confront her, that she refused and stood her ground as it seemed like she normally did, and he lost control and he killed her. Maybe he contacted Katie that day to see if she wanted to hang out because again, over the course of this eight months, they had hung out a couple of times. And then maybe he picked her up, you know, met her at where her car was found, picked her up, brought her to this abandoned house, and that's where everything happened. Weeks passed though before police finally felt that they had enough evidence to finally charge John with Katie's murder. I do believe they were waiting on DNA evidence to come through before they could officially arrest him, but by the time they went to serve him with this arrest warrant, he was gone. He fled driving his red 2000 GMC Yokin, and it appeared that he had taken his 17-year-old girlfriend Hannah along with him. At this point, it wasn't clear if Hannah was taken against her will or if she went with John willingly. The US Marshals joined police to go out and search wherever they could to see if they could find traces of John, Hannah, or their car. They did reportedly find traces of them in Alabama, Killeen, Texas, and California, but I don't know what these traces were, and obviously they didn't catch up with him. Hannah's parents were obviously terrified for their daughter. They had actually found that Hannah's cell phone had been placed in their mailbox and her phone had been completely wiped clean. So pretty much everything on the phone had been erased, so they had no way of saying if she had contacted anyone or what her and John had been talking about. They went on the media to make statements and to spread Hannah's picture and her description out there so that people could be on the lookout for her and hopefully find their daughter and bring her home safely. Hannah his parents waited in agony for seven weeks before Hannah finally contacted them. She called them from a phone in Eugene, Oregon, and she told her mom that she was ready to come home. So, of course, her parents called the police and arranged for her to be picked up. Once they located Hannah, she was at a house in Eugene, Oregon, but John was not with her. Of course, police took Hannah into the station to question her about what happened during their time on the run. Hannah said that during those seven weeks, they had driven all the way across the country, all the way to Oregon, and that they had camped out and stayed in various homeless shelters along the way. She said that after these seven weeks, her and John had separated, but she had two different explanations for how this happened. One story she told was that one night she just fell asleep, 
woke up that next morning and John was no longer there. In another story, she said that one day John went to the bathroom, but he just never came out and she'd been alone ever since. Don't know exactly which one is true, but those are the explanations that she gave. Once Hannah had returned to South Carolina, she led police to where Katie's personal items, such as her phone and purse, had been hidden. They all had been hidden in that abandoned house. I don't know exactly where they were, but they must have been hidden pretty well because according to police, they had searched that house and could not find her personal belongings. So I know some of you might be thinking the same thing as me. I don't know the situation where Cheyenne said that they found that Katie's phone had been located in a house near the abandoned house when it clearly was in the abandoned house. My assumption maybe is that John had led Cheyenne there and he's the one that said, hey, it looks like her house is located in this other man's house near the abandoned house to try to give Cheyenne the idea that maybe this man was the one responsible for whatever happened to Katie at that time. Honestly, I'm not sure what happened with that entire situation. But either way, after this, Hannah basically tried to go back to her normal life. She tried reintegrating herself back into the lives of her friends and just went on with everything as normal. She tried befriending Cheyenne again, but of course Cheyenne wanted nothing to do with her. But as far as I've seen, Hannah has never been accused or charged with anything in relation to having something to do with Katie's murder or knowing anything about what happened. But after that, there really hasn't been anything else that we know of. Obviously at this point, it's assumed that John is the main suspect and that he's fleeing to avoid charges. We don't know what went down to cause the murder at this point, but we do have plenty of reason to believe that John was the one responsible. However, by March of 2020, it was released that a man named Charles Scott Jr. had been arrested back in 2016 for charges for murdering Katie and for possession of a weapon. But the only real thing we even know about this man is that he was an old army buddy of John's, but other than that, I have no idea what his connection is to this case. I tried searching his name and finding any of the articles that were written about this, but all of the articles were either super vague or when I clicked on the link to the article, it had an error message that showed that the article no longer existed. So honestly, I have no idea what information even led them to the arrest. However, Charles took a plea deal to lesser charges of obstruction of justice, which got rid of the other charges of murder and possessing a weapon. I believe this was done because the prosecutors basically admitted that they didn't have really any evidence to prove that he was actually involved in her murder murder. So what my kind of assumption is, or maybe my guess is, is that maybe John had been communicating with him and that he knew more than what he was letting on and that he wouldn't really tell police what happened, but you know, maybe he knew. But other than that, I don't think they think he was actually involved. After the plea deal, he was sentenced to time served, which I believe was four years. And that's pretty much where this case lies now. The last coverage that I've seen on this case was from around 2020, but John is still out there. The TV show In Pursuit with John Walsh came out with an episode to talk about Katie's case in 2019. On the show, a US deputy marshal came out to say that based on John's military training, they believe that he's a danger to society. He's comfortable being un uncomfortable and he will be able to survive in bad conditions for as long as he sees fit. Katie's mom went on to say that John needs to be caught before he destroys another life, takes another life, or destroys another family. True Crime Daily also covered her case a couple of years ago. Both programs were really hoping that by spreading this case nationally that they would get more leads and more tips but I haven't seen any updates posted since then, so here's to giving it another go. John is still out there somewhere, in hiding, after allegedly committing a brutal and heinous murder. So I'm making this video to make people aware or even remind people of this case who already knew about this case and hopefully get Katie's story out there to as many people as I can and to make people familiar with John's face as much as I can. He has to be out there somewhere. Someone must have seen him or spoken to him or knows where he is. It just takes the right person seeing him and coming forward with that information to bring this man to justice and force him to stand in front of a judge and a jury and let them decide if he will face punishment for the murder of his ex-wife, just like the system was built to do. John Blavet is known to be a white male with brown hair and brown eyes, standing at five feet, six inches tall, weighing 185 pounds. He was 28 years old when he fled and he would be 34 now. He was 
was last seen driving his red 2000 GMC Yokin with a South Carolina license plate number JKY829. He has a tattoo of a pirate and a banner with a rose and a sunset on his right arm and a yin yang symbol on his left forearm, a parrot on the right side of his chest, and Madison on his left wrist. He was last known to be in Portland, Oregon. He has been known to use the following aliases, Blue Blavette, John Bluefield, Vincent Mendoza, and Victor Sakiti. Police later came out to say that they received information about him being seen in Arizona and New Mexico, and then his vehicle has been spotted by a license plate reader along the US-Mexico border. Last I saw, there was a $2,500 reward for information leading to John's arrest. He should be considered armed and dangerous. If you see John Blavet, you are urged to contact the Greenville County Crime Stoppers at 864-23-CRIME. So that is all the information that I have on today's case. My heart absolutely goes out to Katie and her family. She literally just ended up in a bad relationship that ended up costing her her life, and that is just so unfair. She had so much more life to live, and she was going to go on to do so many things. So again, if you can do anything to help capture this man who allegedly did this to Katie, please contact the resources that I've stated or any of the resources that I have listed below. But with that, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked today's video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, make sure you click the link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON8 to get 20% off of your native products. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Twitter is where I keep the most up to date with any case that I follow. If you have absolutely any cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel, please make sure you go ahead and send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.